Commercial fishing is both challenging and rewarding. It can also be extremely hazardous. Grab the hatch, Benny! Is it that dangerous? Yeah, it is. Everybody I started with is dead. My old man's boat rolled over. Everybody got whacked. Not everybody. This film documents how commercial fishermen on both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts have made safety an important part of their fishing operation. If it's on the boat, I want it to work. If it doesn't work, then I want it off the boat. If you're over 10 feet, you want to have something on you. I can show you a quick and easy way to do that. Go over something. Did you take your radio course? No. This set here. Hard hats on when we haul the scene back. And... I've been at this business all my life, and there's, al there's always room to learn. Well, the other big safety issue that I was going to try and talk about today is uh, money. It's the big one, right? You get floats up, the light comes on. Brian Boudreau, like fifth generation fisherman in Shetakamp, Nova Scotia, is changing over from crab to mackerel fishing and familiarizes his crew with all onboard safety procedures. Items he covered off were standard with any vessel safety orientation, air and fuel shutoffs, firefighting equipment, emergency suits, EPIRB, and life Pull on this handle. Swing her open. Like you say, maybe that zipper doesn't oh, no. work anymore. Pop well, there you are trying to get somebody else's suit. I'll get know? that one off and get God it off. God Almighty, <laughs> give me your suit. <laughs> no, <laughs> mine doesn't work. You know, what are you, you going to do? My You're going to have to go in the water. To ensure effective life raft boarding procedures were clearly understood, oh, Brian okay. sailed outside Shetta Camp Harbor okay. and conducted an abandoning vessel drill. During the drill, Brian tested out a new emergency. I've been fishing since I've been a teenager and going out with my dad and for the last 12 or 15 years I've been pretty well captain on board and it's been a, a great experience and so far so good we haven't had any accidents or anybody gone overboard or anything like that so we're just getting set up for seining so I just hired two new guys on board so it was I had to make sure that they knew where things were and in case of a fire or something bad happened. It's just a, a quick overview of the boat. And it's my responsibility to make sure that they know what to do and how to do it. And hopefully they have their MED up to par. To go fishing, to get your lodge license or a license, you need a course. One time you didn't have to, now you do, which is a good idea. 13 16 black eye line has a safety to the power block just in case there's a failure on the gearmatic or the shackle or something so the block doesn't fall down. John Lennick, owner of the Ocean Marauder out of Vancouver, BC, is changing gear over from tuna to the sardine fishery. He explains some safety procedures he has implemented and how things have changed over the years. I never really was worried about safety when I was fishing salmon and herring because we seemed to have that under control. When I converted the boat to black Hawk and we ended up putting 25, 30 tons on deck in the middle of winter, plus everything else, the boat's full of stuff. When I converted the boat, I had the uh, architect at the shipyard run it through stability to make sure that the work, everything was fine because they were working offshore and. January, February, big storms. Talk about green water breaking across the deck. And so then I became interested in safety. In 1974, we built the Needham Maria at John Manley Shipyards. We had five deck manholes on. The first trip out on herring, we had a load of herring on board and we we're traveling down the west coast and looked out the galley door and I see herring on deck. Wonder where they're coming from. I saw two of the manholes that popped off and the uh, water was coming in and the fish were going out. When we went to unload at that time, one of the manholes was loose and one of the unloading crew fell down in the fish hole. We took them all off. I've had six boats built since then. None of them had manly manholes on deck. New crew member Spencer Serka had taken his marine emergency duties training prior to coming on board. First thing in my head would be the muster list, what we do in an emergency regarding the muster list. And we're top heavy because of uh, the type of fishing we're doing. 
and uh, because we got that big power block in the air that weighs a lot, we got dewatering box up in the air, so you. you Gary Porthier, skipper on the 85-foot Tasha Marie, has been fishing for 41 years. Tied up in Yarmouth, standing by for a herring opening, he detailed some of the safety features on board. If this piston lets go, we got a safety chain. You know, all, all our stuff has got safety stuff on it because of working underneath everything. Gary clearly explained how they deal with single crossbar manhole covers. We never had problems because they're welded tight. Because these boats are underwater a lot. So you don't want no, a leaky manhole or something like that because it, it just causes you a problem. So we welded everything tight. Engineer Bob Thibault explained how the vessel owner felt about routine maintenance. So far, anything that goes wrong or if I see any problems with her, there's no hesitation to get it fixed. And get it fixed properly. Like the piping system within the last couple of years for the fish holes, they all been replaced. Started blowing holes because of electrolysis in her, in the pipes, and instead of just putting patches, we took them all apart and replaced them, put everything new. You wanna get this one out now, Stan? If there's money there, then the guys don't go, oh, we'll change that next year. We'll change it now, before it breaks. Of course, what I'm talking about is preventative maintenance, right? And that starts in town before you leave the dock. For instance, on a continuous basis, we're always inspecting our rigging, right? You know, like uh, you're always looking to make sure that shackles aren't worn, uh, cables aren't worn out, ropes aren't worn out, you know, like anything overhead, we're always going over that stuff on a continuous basis. So with this radar now, a couple Brian Dickens took here. over the helm of the North I Isle two months prior to this interview. While delivering a boatload of hake in Vancouver, BC, he expressed his opinion on vessel safety. Let the guys always know if you smell something on the boat that doesn't smell right or you see smoke, check it out. Never ever assume that, ah, oh, that's nothing. You smell that? What the hell is that? Check it out. This fire extinguisher is here and this is what it's for. This one is here and this is what it's for. This is what your job is in case of a fire. You know, maybe it's stay out of the friggin' way. I don't know. There's not a whole lot we can do to stop that right at this time. One of the things that we learned from the fire that we had on the Ocean Selector was we always assumed that when there was a fire, we were all gonna be there. Guess what? The only guy that was on that boat at that time was a day raider. Luckily for him, he did the right thing. He got off the boat and phoned 911. But it made me realize maybe the engineer ain't gonna be the guy that's standing there to pull the halon system or to close all the dampers and to shut off the fuel. We got our fuel shut offs right here on, in the galley floor. So what I do is I make sure that everybody knows if this guy's not here, then this is what you gotta do. Otherwise, it's his responsibility, right? You know, because the last thing that we want to have happen is for the engineer to be in the engine room and somebody pull the halon system. I bought my first license back in 1957. Ashton Spinney, longtime lobsterman out of Argyle, Nova Scotia, explains how vessel orientations work in the lobster fleet. These are bilge alarms, lazarette in the hole. All of our boats are built the same. So basically when you walk aboard one boat, your air, your shut, air off shut off here. might be, instead of being in that corner, it may be right where you're standing. But they're all the principles all the same. The uh, uh, emergency pumping, and right under where I'm standing is all the same. Uh, it's just a matter of lifting a hatch, it's there. The, Your life jackets the, uh, are pr uh, predominantly in the same place. It's survival suits layers. in the same place. So it's not something you have to go through every day because like Jason has his own boat and he has worked on this one before. And, and as you see, we have a, a different fleet than they are in on the West Coast, totally different. 
dollar fifty a pound. Now, that's These guys are from like Newfoundland, out here pounds, visiting so. a mutual friend. They decided that they wanted to come out for a tuna adventure. I can't see it because it's under the this second midship lawn. We had a problem with this one when we were out there, so this was happening uh, in the middle of the ocean as well. Pull her tight. Chris Gunderson. Tuna boat skipper with over 15 years experience on large and small vessels was in port at Euclid, BC, repairing some rigging. With a green crew on board, he explained okay, his safety going. orientation. The thing is, they're like they're eager to learn, so and that's all you're looking for, really. It doesn't matter who it is. If they're eager to learn, then then it's easy. First trip we did was 16 days, and we filled this thing up. So he knows what he's doing to catch a tuna, and he knows what he's doing to run this boat, so we know we're in good hands. You know, we did the knot thing, and practiced tying up the boat stuff on the dock, and... It's all a ropes game here, I guess. Get something to someone, and back to the boat. That's, that's been a big rule, a safety rule. Having worked on all sizes of vessels, Chris knows that every orientation is vessel specific. There you go. Well done. The same thing that we do with everybody, you know, when they come on board, uh, you know, the life raft, where the life rafts were kitted, the EPIRB, um, you know, the life jacket survival suits, you know, you make them put them on. We uh, had to get our own survival suits, so that was number one, was that we knew we had to have survival suits. They gave us the long list of safety equipment that we needed, and then once we got on board and were about to leave, they gave us the tour on where everything was location of the fire extinguishers is an important one that I think gets overlooked quite a bit because I've been in situations where I've had to use them and I've actually been looking around for them. If you don't know where they are, that's half the battle. There's your 30 seconds that you had advantage that's gone. Oh, and you got to wear sunglasses when you're pulling tuna because the hooks are dangerous. You might lose an eye. This is common. This is, it's a safety feature, we've been told. <laughs> Scott Blagden and Ron Martin of Shelburne, Nova Scotia are getting ready for another long line trip. Propane stove, emergency shut offs over here. Anything happens to it, you hit the button, shut your propane off. All you have to do is this distress button, hold it over for five seconds. An alarm will sound at the Coast Guard. Scott took the we'll time to explain it's radio it's procedures to Ron, as well as a brief right, overview of other onboard safety equipment. Your life jackets, show you where they are. They'll know what boat it is, what to look for. If you have time, you call them back, tell them your emergency, put your mate out. Any given day, you may have three different men. You don't know whether they fit them or whether they don't, you know. Company owner George Renahan had his own ideas about storing your survival suit. I believe that a man should sleep with his suit and his life jacket under his head for his pillow because you'll take perfect care of your pillow. You never let anything happen to your pillow. So why would you have ain't let what anything happen? When you go on deck and you're working, your suit's down forward, you can't get well, there. That's, the that's a gamble you have so to you take. Put a radiant here, you yeah. reach in through, you got yeah. it. Oh, yeah. And that's an argue, not an argument man of point. You know, everybody has their own preferences. Every vessel's different. Yeah. Ryan McKechnie. Third generation salmon gillnet fisherman out of Mission, BC, is skipper of the Ryan D. He detailed his safety procedures when working alone. In our family, we kind of accept that when you're by yourself, you need to be more careful. Generally, you fish a little slower. It should always be at the top of your mind that you're undergoing a slightly more dangerous activity than, than it would be if you had someone with you, I guess. But you can take precaution to counteract that. I think there's some obvious things that most every fisherman does and that's you never never leave the cockpit or the wheelhouse when the boat's in gear. You're always in neutral. I wear a life jacket at all times even in the cabin and I'm wearing one right now actually. Fall in the water uh, I have a loop of rope over the side, always, always on that side, on any boat I'm fishing. And it's right even with the water line. I know I can get my foot in it and get back on. In fact, when I do diving on the boat, I use the same way to get back in the boat. You have to go to the bathroom, stop, take the boat out of gear, go to the bathroom, then go back to the cabin and, and uh, continue on. That's, 
That was one of the things we were taught as a kid. We travel in packs, fishing groups, so you're always trying to keep track of your other fishermen and touch base with them every set. It's good to really uh, test and try things. Also. Paul Bevendick and second year crewman Tyle McLaughlin test out their safety equipment and man overboard procedures on the Fraser River in Steveston, BC. Uh, my survival suit's over 20 years old, and uh, the new survival suit, the white that uh, Tyler used to jump in, it kept him completely dry. The light came on. That's good. It looked good. The, he floated really well. He was dry. We got to practice hauling him back on board. We used the hauler. We used the tire. We had him uh, climb up. We also put a strap around him and hauled him up. I'm going to improve on my ladder, and I'm going to improve on our safety rope. We can go over this. Uh, again, we did last year. I've added a couple of uh, sections, this uh, checklist and drills. So I'll just go grab a pen and we'll uh, just sign off on uh, this uh, crew orientation. Just, you know, use your brain, you don't <laughs> just run out and grab things. And yeah, watch out for each other, make sure nobody goes overboard. Watch out for cables and ropes. Same with anything, I guess, in the fishing industry. Common sense. Yeah, sort of a soap. Blake Mitchell, <laughs> skipper of the Herring Purse Saner Silver Harvester 1 out of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, is standing by to leave for another night of herring fishing. With a seasoned crew of six, four of them brothers, Blake explains how safety has become routine on their vessel. It's an issue that I see myself as, as being self-preservation. It's not something that you should have to have a government agency and then tell you how to implement safety. You just should work safe and just think ahead about what you're doing. I'm actually second man in the skiff. I always wear a float jacket and stuff like that. And the other guy in the skiff wears a float jacket. I mean, if we have a big set of fish that we know there's going to be a heavy load on that, there's a safety cable that gets hooked in the other side to make sure if something lets go, we've got an extra uh, safety there. Uh, nobody has to be told to do that, we do it. Regardless of what you're doing, whether you're uh, board a boat fishing or if you're driving a vehicle, nobody should have to tell you, keep good tires on your vehicle. It's not safe to have ball tires and it's my life that I'm, you know, trying to preserve. It's, somebody shouldn't have to regulate that, it's just common sense. A sack of narrows, a sack of narrows, Queen's Reach. John Leggett, a salmon and herring fisherman, is skipper of the Queen's Reach, a boat he built in 1976. Preparing for a chum salmon opening, he has this to say about mentoring safety aboard his vessel. With these young guys, uh, you like to bring them up to speed. You're certainly uh, concerned with beach man and skiff man safety and we insist upon it that they wear a life jacket when they're in the skiff. We've seen lots of upsettings and sinkings and, and problems. You know the PFD is compulsory. We had uh, John uh, Kirkovich from the Union come down and, and we went over uh, some of the, the beach man skills. Uh, we spent a day just uh, practicing it with a skiff and a skiff man and a, and a piling and the various knots and do's and don'ts and things to look out for and, and the beach man who'd been on board for a couple of years so he knew the actual responsibilities and what the idea was. He was very good as a beach man, no problems, he got his knot down well and it seemed to release uh, just fine for him. Uh, that was a big help. No, it's good. Okay, then. 
Wasden's obviously we're taking the tail shaft out here now. All the, all the Gordy Wasden, Sane skipper, was in port in Richmond, BC for his vessel's four-year Transport Canada Canadian steamship inspection. You know, let's be honest, CSI, none of us like it, but you know, like what we're doing now is checking your seacocks. Let's make sure they're working properly. You know, I mean, you know, very important. Your overboards are in good shape. You know, if you don't check these things over the years, they're going to deteriorate, and then you know that can cause you a problem. So yeah, it's it's, it's you know checking your shaft is very important. You know, see if there's any fatigue or anything on it. So you you know you only have to do it every four years, but it's you know it's a costly adventure, but yeah, it gives you a peace of mind. I think you know your stuff's working. I mean, fuel shut off. You know, you gotta have them. Keeps your boat up to speed. You know. Here's where we keep our fire suits. Two complete suits with boots and everything. Here's where the guys hang their PFDs when they're not in use. The Hollaback. John Roach, skipper of the fishing vessel Frosty, one of the largest ground fish vessels on the BC coast explains how his crew has incorporated PFDs into their fishing routine. The crew are wearing PFDs now, and hard hats. Why though? Well, we, we, because I told them they had to, <laughs> basically. But they're, you know, they know that if they fall overboard, that's gonna save their life. Or it could, not necessarily, but it's another thing in their favor. Now here's our procedures manual that's in this bookshelf all the time. Uh, what you do, vessel management, wheelhouse, muster stations, emergency towing, electrical loss, steering loss, propulsion loss in heavy weather, fueling, uh, you can refuel both uh, stateside and uh, Canadian docks. So this is the gospel, this is the Bible. Well, Stan comes in with the problem Like I say, from the boat owner's point of view, the liability issues are just, every time you hear of a disaster and and everybody's looking for the cause and who to point the finger at. And just by saying, uh, well, I didn't know that, we're not, it's not going very far anymore. It's, it's, you're supposed to know it. Making sure your safety equipment is safe. You don't have a breathing apparatus. Which is where we're lucky here with our, you know, our, our mates are good that they, they can tell the new guys on the boat. As a master, you, lots of times you don't have time to sit down and lead this guy around by the hand to exactly. show him everything. But if somebody else on the boat is capable and knowledgeable and, and interested in it, then uh, it works a lot better for us, makes our life easier. Uh, the way I wear it, uh, I never notice it at all. Wait and see right now whether the weather's going to be. If a fisherman tells you that he feels it's not safe to go out, don't question him. And we had 20-something foot seas come late that day. You can't fake what comes at you. You know, the camera's rolling and whammo, you get hit. You can't stage that. So you don't want a leaky manhole or something like that because it just causes you a problem. Of course, you're so old, you got to stay on top of things all the time. I like to point out to my crew that that lady directing traffic around the construction site has got steel-toed shoes, a hard hat, a safety vest, and she's only standing on the side of the street. Normally before we leave, we have a muster station drill only. We give everybody up with warm clothing, survival suits. They know what the survival suits are. I still believe that the men shoot on them themselves and then they look after them better. Probably practice it at least once a year, beginning of the season. The three fellows from Alberta did take the MED course. When you're place. fishing, safety is, it's always in the back of your mind. We could go on until... New people stop. coming into the industry now, they know a little bit about it before they get out there. You know, just to have the mindset of keeping safety first. That's the way to do it, for sure.
Earning a living as a commercial fisherman provides for a lifestyle like no other occupation in Canada. Vessel safety is an important part of doing business. What does safety on your vessel look like?